Great. Uh, well, welcome back to another episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to host Guillaume Caban, uh, also known as G. And I think G in this case stands for the godfather of growth, at least in my mind, that you'll tell us what it really means, Guillaume. But uh, uh, Guillaume uh, ran a growth at some of the most exciting B2B companies like Drift and Segment. He's now advising uh, some of the most exciting uh, B2B companies through his uh, new platform, Hypergrowth Partners, which provides um, B2B companies with ways to grow faster in exchange for equity. Guillaume, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. I, I, I know when I, I meet a fellow European because they can pronounce my name properly. Oh, well, I have married a French woman, and so I can do a very good uh, French. I know, my, my I realize that. ability is... Uh, good impression. Enough. So we could always switch into exaggerated French accent uh, to highlight Except points. But um, but uh, I, I think, uh, well, I mean, I, I was actually thinking of like, how would I Frenchify that you're like, you, you are too gross what Givenchy is to haute couture, to high fashion. So you're like, <laughs> you you really um, love this topic. You know, you're one of the first, in my view, to look up what are the most, you know, what are, what are the innovations, what are interesting startups doing? You're applying it, you're using it across gazillions of companies that you and your, your colleagues, you know, contribute to. So this is a masterclass in in this discipline. So you know, really excited to have you on. Uh, I guess some of the topics that would be relevant is maybe take take a step back for for our audience that are less familiar with the function of growth and sort of how it emerged um, from from yeah. kind of the inbound era of HubSpot maybe over to uh, you know the present day, and then let's kind of spend some time wow. as well covering wow. the future. Wow! Wow! Okay, let's see. Let's see. It's it's interesting. I, I think that there's like two kind of like time tracks uh, we can kind of run in parallel, which is like growth as a function within mm -hmm. organizations, and also like my story, which which evolved in in parallel. And, and to all people thinking like, how did I land here? Honestly, I got incredibly lucky. I was at the right place at the right time, multiple times in a row. All right, mm -hmm. which which led me to be at say uh, doubling down on growth, just as as it was becoming a thing. But just to take a step back, growth as we think of it today uh, comes from B two C platforms, mm -hmm. namely uh, Facebook and Dropbox and a couple of others, but you know, pr primarily Facebook. I'd say um, back in the mid two thousands, where there were some teams that were facing incredible. Uh, usage volume. And so they had the capabilities, uh, thanks to just, you know, number of users of testing many different uh, website experience variants, Facebook, you know, features uh, mm -hmm. per day, per day, which uh, it's a combination of volume, technology, tools, and um, access to engineers and analysts at the same time. And, and that just started to happen mid 2000. Before that, you, I, you either had high volume in like some, I'd say, um, specific B2C platforms, mostly like uh, content, but mm -hmm. there was no like engineers and analysts that attached to that, or, or there was the opposite, right? Um, and, and, and they were able to reignite growth and, and basically to create um, winning variants at scale. Mm -hmm. And that, become, that became popular. Um, it took another, I'd say, five-ish years before that started to arrive in the world of B2B. But here's the catch. Um, in B2B, you don't have volume, right? Yeah. You're just never yeah. going to have Facebook volume in B2B. It's never going to happen, which means most of the time you can't run um, that number of volumes. And so it, growth took a different... Um, face application in B2B, and it is a lot more growth hacky in the sense that you're going to find you're still using engineers and analysts, but you're doing a lot more demand gen -y stuff, right? mm -hmm. especially in the mid early 2010s, when we're doing most of the B2B SaaS was sales led. So we're just mm -hmm. creating yeah. leads for sales team. I'm not saying that in a, in a you know, patronizing way, right? But that was the, the core function. 
that's where I evolve, right? And so, and, and so level like, said for people, those leads are incredibly valuable, right? Like, so it, it sort of was, blood. there may not be, this is the lifeblood of the business, yeah, right? They're, you know, you know, this, if, especially in the enterprise sales context, but even yeah. in the, in the kind of current world of product like growth, it's still, it's still a kind of a, you know, high yeah. value thing to find your target audience that cares. And so now about. that you're talking of product like growth or PLG, it's interesting, which is this is coming full, full circle. Yeah. As I said, like we went from like B2C teams doing like A-B testing in app to B2B teams doing demand gen growth hacky stuff, top of funnel outside of the app. And now that we're doing PLG uh, products on B2B SaaS, now growth teams are in B2B doing in-app let's say testing, mm -hmm. it's come back full circle to the original thing of, of golf, right? And, and to be to be honest, both teams exist, depending on the yeah. business and how the yeah. business runs. You have some business which are sales led, some are PLG, and you're going to have either like a top of funnel growth team or a bottom of funnel, mid of funnel, yeah. like app growth team. And it always feels like at least in, in large chunks of B2B world, there's sort of this hybrid category, which some people call product led sales, yep. which you know, basically still says, hey, let's use some demand gen and top of the funnel tactics to get people into the product and then uh, be very sophisticated about how we, you know, expand those opportunities um, yeah. through adoption within companies. Yeah. Like in the, in, 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 and this sort of gray area, like I'm, I'm really curious at what you're taking on how that's evolved because people like to simplify. It's like PLG is the flavor of the day. You know, the sales led is like old school and only works for the, you know, for the, you know, oracles and Accentures. I think you as a practitioner probably see the gray areas and the interconnections much more, you know, yeah. take us through that. I think that there's two thoughts that come to mind when you ask that. One is every board and, and CEO slash founder basically wants low CAC. This is like... Yeah. That's the goal. Like all the rest is like means to end, right? They want yeah. low CAC and high LTV. And so there are like a few and ways- And I'm just going to gonna editorialize this. So for, for those that are not, you know, in the, you know, more in the marketing or or, or sales side of the uh, spectrum that are not deep, more in the creative side, CAC is customer acquisition cost. Correct. And LTV is lifetime value yes, of sorry, customers. Yes. So basically, um, how expensive is it to acquire people versus yeah. how much money they bring? Yeah. And it's really just a cash flow question. Yeah. It's like, when do you start making a profit? And for how long do you make a profit after you acquire them? All right. A thought example, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, that I like to use um, is if you offered every customer of your SaaS a free Tesla in order to, to purchase, you would have a 100% conversion, right? But then your CAC, would be a Tesla, like 40, 50,000 bucks, right? Yeah. So not profitable for most people, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, most businesses. I and mean, I so, think Greta Turnberg is a little too young, but other than that, yeah, I think you're, I think you're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, it's about capital efficiency. Yeah. And if you can bring low CAC, high LTV, you have a very capital efficient business, thus you command very high, it's so multiples, a new next valuation, very effective founder, CEO, okay? There are a few ways to have low CAC and high LTV. One is have a competitive moat on the top of funnel where the acquisition is fairly efficient, right? And that is not going to be paid because that is priced in the click, all right? That's the whole point of AdWords and others, like it's priced in the click, okay? Up. So it can be outbound, okay? It can be SEO, or it can be PLG, right? And the reason why founders love conceptually PLG, it's because users acquire other users; they acquire themselves for yeah. free. So conceptually, it sounds great. In practice, almost every business I work with at scale does a combo of trying some PLG on small and medium businesses and doing effectively some product-led sales on the mid-market and enterprise. Mm -hmm. Everyone does kind of both. Mm -hmm. 
that so so that's very practical um application so like you started talking let's let's kind of st stick to the top of the funnel for a second because one yeah. of the things that i love about growth is that you know I, something that worked uh yesterday uh may work uh today but much worse and may not work particularly well tomorrow and we were like we see this near and dear to our heart is we could still see people you know sending out you know 30 year old formats like pdfs uh you know at a pretty large scale in the b2b world because they read somewhere that the the playbook you know 20 years ago was you kind of you you created you know offer and then you gated you ask people to fill out a bunch of things and then after that, you kind of, you know, they get to download your 50 page PDF and it does work to some degree, but it, it is sort of takes you back to a kind of pre uh, pre World Wide Web consumption experience, which may also take away from your brand positioning, from your product positioning, make people not engage. And so we see this and we go, this is crazy, right? Like, you know, we understand why people may want to print something, but, you know, download it, but you may not want to lead with that in this kind of on, on the screen as the first step that you know you would drive people towards but yet i see this kind of every day and you see probably this plus a bunch of other things that people do that's no longer working so what are some of these kind of crazy things that you go why are we doing this what is it mm -hmm. in the human behavior for marketers that should be performance driven innovation driven that's preventing us to apply yeah. the latest lessons yeah. And so I want to take a step back here. It's like, why is, why does growth exist compared to like marketing? It's in, mm -hmm. in substance, that's what you're asking, right? You're describing what marketers, marketing teams are doing. And you're saying what they're doing is not effective. Why are they doing it? That also asks the question of like, why do growth teams exist? And why are they capable of doing other things? And it's a question of incentives, right? A marketing team, if you look at how they're incentivized, they're not incentivized to take risks. Mm. Okay, because every time you take a risk, there's a high chance of there's a chance of failure. Which is, mm -hmm. No varies, but there's a chance of failure. As a marketer, when you fail, you launch a campaign that doesn't work and is a failure. Um, that's a that's a huge problem. It's a, it's a huge problem. It's better to do something which is fairly standard, typical, so you can have some mediocre but okay-ish result mm. than to try mm -hmm. and stand out, take a risk, and like um, go home, All right? And keep your fact, job. Keep your job. You know, by IBM. Yeah, by yeah. IBM is, is what yeah. you would say. By right? IBM. Don't yeah. take risk. Never by Oracle, okay. SAP, right? And so, yeah. don't take the risk. The um, growth works because the incentive is different they mm. operate like angel investors right really they have limited information they have a reasonable hypothesis and they're going to launch a lot of tests to see which one sticks and failing at 70 percent within the growth team is normal that's part of the job because the 30 percent 20 percent that succeed will pay for all of the failures will compensate. Okay, those are the outlying uh, experiments, the outlier winners in, in angel investments, right? And so the operation principle is different. Um, the returns are different. Um, the quality of the ship is different, right? And that's why it works. But that is also why growth teams don't last very long because eventually one of those failures has a high internal political cost and it kind of like disbands the team. All right. And so it's very, very hard to have a separate growth team with a separate culture that operates for a long period of time. All right. It's effective, but it's difficult. This is super fascinating. So when I when I kind of think of the way some investors describe what it takes to succeed, is that you need to have some some sort of hook in your product, right? That may drive maybe PLG or other things, but it's something that's a, delivers well on the product. And then some kind of competitive edge in distribution, and that let's mm -hmm. let's say that kind of let's label that as growth for now, even sure. though it's 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 not there. And it's literally like this is the playbook, and you need this playbook not just one time when you're like in Series A to Series B. Ideally, this is a playbook that 
you have like like you said this portfolio strategy and like when one distribution strategy slows down you have two or three others that can pick up you've tested them and then you maybe let marketers or whoever else in the product team to execute it so there is this sort of invest investors get this and yet what i'm hearing you say is these these growth teams don't last um so help us reconcile is it you know is it just the pressure of large organizations is it um something that is just kind of as a discipline and hasn't like matured sufficiently that's, kind of yeah that, yes um there are extremely few chief growth officers extremely yeah. few that i can name that have actually uh made it to the executive team and and stayed in that cgo role there is uh th that's the first thing second thing is think of of growth what does the team look like okay it is a collection a handful of marketers um engineers sometimes a pm or something like that right an analyst okay so you either hiring so one person needs to be able as a leader to effectively hire a talent a plus talent in all of those different roles which is very difficult okay mm. or borrow from other teams right yeah. take over right and then that person is going to be pushing experiments on the turf of either marketing or product okay mm. and every time they fail that's very visible. Every time they succeed, what happens? Well, they need to move on to the next experiment. So they ship back or they hand over the winning experiments back to the team that owns that surface area, either marketing or product. Or product. Hmm. If you're on the receiving they get, end of they that, get the glory. They get the glory in the end. Exactly. Like great exactly. People love it. <laughs> if exactly that. If you if you are on the receiving end on marketing a product and you get the blame when you fail, but the growth guys don't. That's their job. But when they succeed, they get the glory, and then you need to clean up and document that. Ah, come on. Like, that's terrible. And so that's hard to maintain at scale because the boundaries are not clear. There's no surface area that's clearly the uh, ownership of growth. It's very rare. I'll give you a couple of questions. Do you pay, mm. pay in marketing and growth or in marketing? Do you put SEO there? Or in marketing, you put outbound there or in sales, right? Or do they touch everything? And so it is effective at a scale, I'd say around 50 to a couple hundred employees, mm. because those boundaries are not super well defined. There's lots of jobs to be There's done. A lot of generalists, the CEO still, who is the yeah. ultimate generalist, still kind of supports yes. this, right? Like once the, you pass the thousand. Yeah. Mm. it's not it's very very rare very difficult there are exceptions because in some cases there are exceptional leaders um look for example at Luke at Shopify chief growth mm -hmm. officer right but effectively he owns all the top of funnel all of it right so then if, the, if what you're describing is kind of the underlying challenge to the discipline um, how do you go on, right? If you still want to deliver disproportionate growth, if you're, let's say the CMO, right. And there was a sort of role like growth marketing persona, right? Like maybe they don't work as well as the yeah. product team. I would recommend. But how would you go about it, this? It depends on the stage. Very, very clearly depends on the stage. If we look, uh, at say at the early stage, uh, marketing doesn't matter. In most cases, what you want is demand gen at the early stage, quite like series A, series B, you just want more leads, right? And you basically want to capture all of the early adopters market. Um, and so you can have a team that is effectively just growth, right? And, and they try to find a uh, competitive advantage. One or two channels where they have much better CAC to LTV ratios than the next competitor. And it's almost there's no religion because there's no big organizations yet. Like exactly. you're agile. So yep. whatever you gain the advantage, you you yep. go double down on that. Yeah. Then as you grow, you're probably going to standardize, stabilize some of the key channels, generally starting by paid, right? Um, and you're going to start investing in brand marketing, awareness, events, partnerships, which are outside of the world of growth, right? And my recommendation is as you grow, you probably want to separate brand awareness events 
um, into a brand marketing team, mm. have a um, product marketing team, and then have a growth team, which is in charge of demand gen, right? Very close to like all of the core channels. That is my recommendation. Eventually at scale, late stage, I would have one growth team doing top of funnel and one growth team doing product growth in product, close, very probably embedded in the product team. It depends on leaders mostly. Depends on leaders. So, but like, I think let's take a step back. So what you described fundamentally is just good, um, good business, right? Like you, you sure. find a clever way to, you know, find, find and engage your target audience, right? That, you know, converts into, you know, profitable customers over time. Uh, so this CAC to LTV thing. Yet, um, it feels like when we, outside of maybe investors, right, that are really paying attention to this sort of disproportionate outcome models, when you speak to an average kind of marketing or product meeting, this is not the conversation um, that would happen. And so, you know, the, the big opportunity, it seems that even if, right, like maybe the growth lives in different pockets, the way you organize it differs, but like you still want to imbue this philosophy across the organization, right? And, and it's a life philosophy, right? You're experimenting in to theory, find yes. the, the, you know, broadly, like where's the big gains that don't don't suck the life out of you, right? Like that are sort of like, so how, where are you finding, I mean, this seems like common sense, but right? people are not risk work. takers, Alex. Mm. Like people are not like very few people like you know gambling of the gambling mindset mm. uh, uh, in a way when it comes to business they they want tried and true. Every time you take a growth ex experiment, you're running a hypothesis, you're running a numbers game on likelihood of failure and likelihood of success. So two things. One, you need to be very creative, come up with ideas that no one else has, right? Time and time again. And then you need to be really uh, grounded, grounded um, in numbers and in, in, you know, building your hypothesis properly. The problem th there is that that's, that's a those unicorn. two personalities that's, that's operate unicorn, at right? opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so having somebody that does both is extremely rare, right? You tend to have either very creative, crazy folks who like, especially like if you look in the brand side of marketing, they're very good, very yeah. creative. Yeah. And but it's just like, they never look at numbers. Yeah. Right? They don't they never do like, I create, I create, therefore I am. It's like totally divorced yeah. from output or outcome. Yeah. Or you have on the opposite side, yeah, you have the people yeah. who do paid marketing and they turn yeah. they turn knobs and dials every day to like optimize yeah. the, the 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 CPC, the cost per click. Um, but like creativity is not their forte, right? Having an organization that's capable of doing both, uh, a whole team that's capable of doing both, appreciate the creativity, the craziness, see the opportunity in the crazy idea, run with it, and then religiously look at the numbers, implement analysis, and do a post-mortem. It's very hard. It's this renaissance unicorn that we're looking for. And it's interesting that you still have a, you know, a huge audience of fans that are reaching out to you, right, that are kind of trusting your input on what are the best companies, whether it's like Sequoia, Sequoia mm -hmm. Scout role, mm -hmm. or kind of your own advisory role, where it, it seems like the the VCs are the ones that are bringing you in. Absolutely. Um, you know, more often than not. So you're kind of the sort of special forces that comes in and helps organization. Is Are you imbuing that DNA or are you sharing your best practices, you know, in collections? Yeah. Like what are you doing I, when you have a I typical engagement? Yeah, that's a good question. Generally, I mean, I've been doing this for like a couple of decades now, for better or worse. And, uh, and generally... Uh, I come loaded with a bag of tricks because uh, I I know what's very likely to work based on things I've done in the past couple of years in similar businesses. All right, so I can replicate past successes and give and give the, this team a feeling of sensation that they are extremely good and everything they touch is working. All right, 
but slowly I'm edging them towards experimentation, taking more risks and getting away of things that are mm. tried and true that I know. By the time my engagement is over, if I did a good job, they are testing uh, hundreds of experiments per quarter, literally hundred. All right. Got it. So you're starting with low hanging fruits around pattern matching. You kind of yes. find arbitrage effectively yeah. based on your previous experience. Like, hey, in this industry, this arbitrage still remains. Let's go take yeah. take take the low hanging fruit. Yeah. And then over time, you say you need to find new areas of arbitrage. Yeah. Competitors and it's are paying very attention. Very easy. Yeah. Like you just come into an outside eye, you look at the funnel, you and you ask for the conversion rate per stages. You start mm -hmm. at the bottom of the funnel, you see where most of the pipeline in dollars is is leaking. All right. Mm -hmm. And just work your way up. And generally at every stage, you can find unnecessary friction that was mm -hmm. added for the wrong reason over time. And you ask the question, like, can we remove this friction? Right. Can we just like make away with it? Right. And um and we create a better user experience. I'll give you like two very obvious examples. One is everyone in the PLS and product led sales business has a demo contact us form. And at least half of the businesses I talk to uh, request unnecessary fields on those forms. They ask for the first name, last name, company name, role and title, right? In addition to email. Um, and, and, and other things, right? And I always say the same thing. They, they get a little arrogant. I think sometimes they ask for your phone number, which is like, yeah. yes, yeah, I'd love to uh, share that with you. <laughs> and Would you like and my mobile? What I say is, <laughs> if you have a demo form, yeah. that means you're trying to create leads for your sales team. What you care yeah. about is qualified leads, not the others, obviously, yeah. right? And so there are two things that can be true. Either this person is qualified and they're using a business email and that company is extremely likely to be existent with your data vendor, be it Zoom Info, Clarbit, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, you don't need to ask for the first name, last name, and company name. You can extract yeah. all of that from the data vendor. Mm -hmm. Or that person is not qualified. They're using a Gmail or whatever, or like it's a super small business in, in somewhere else in the world. And you're never going to talk to them anyways. And so the added value you get from capturing the data from them is lich. It's non-existent. And it's costing you seven percentage points per field, right? Right. So if you have five fields, you're basically, you know, halving your conversion rate, if, yeah. if not more, right? Like, yeah. It's sort of, yeah. And then yeah. if you, and people thought, oh, I'm going to be very clever. I'm going to ask you for your email first, and then I'm going to expand the field yeah. and ask yeah. you for five other things. I'm like, you're, you're, yeah. you're such an you asshole. You don't need that. You're you don't asshole. need it. You're creating this yeah. asshole experience. If that person is qualified, right? yeah. Yeah. you don't need for anything. You want to talk to them regardless. Okay. Yeah. And so we're adding friction for the purposes of qualification in a way yeah. that's not necessary. I'll give you another example. Yeah. If you know that person's qualified, what is the experience? The experience is they fill a form, they get an email saying, Hey, we got your form, we'll get back to you. Then an SD qualifies them in Salesforce, right? Reaches out to them by an email, says, Hey, Alex, we'd love to talk to you. Here's a calendar. Yeah. There's a few back and forth to try and book the meeting. And then they yeah. talk to an AE. By, by then, probably like a week has passed and the yeah. appetite has gone down. What if, like, Alex is on the website. Alex puts his email. Alex is qualified. Great company. Just offer a Calendly Chili Piper link uh, pop-up just there. Just there on the spot, right? Just do the qualification behind the scenes with our friends from Mad Kudu, others just like offer yeah. the Chili Piper there, right? Yeah. That's much less friction. Even better, what if, you don't need to book the meeting. You have an A that's available and you just, hey, like, let's just jump yeah. on the Zoom, right? Alex is on the site right now. Alex has intent. Alex is interested. Let's just yeah. do the call right now, Yeah. right? Much less friction because yeah. at every stage of that process I described earlier, filling the form, getting an email from the SD, booking Calendly, attending yeah. the meeting, you are dropping by 20% yeah. the audience at every stage. If you compress that, then you're getting all that conversion back. Yeah, I love it. Well, That's my mother hard. is not French, but you're you're like a brother from another mother because you're speaking the language and the sort of thing that we see. So for example, like I, you know, I got to this, you got me to this ebook, right? And like imagine I could just book a meeting, whether it's again Chili Piper or Calendly yeah. or HubSpot sure. meeting, like it's a live embed right inside there. 
I book that meeting or chat to your point and you know but I continue to consume the content right like I'm yeah. like I'm still like I'm interested now why are you like making me go download this pdf or whatever leave you know like find it somewhere in like in the bowels of my computer I'll never come back to your site because I have never. 50 tabs open right and that's so that's one thing or like I paid a boatload of money to implement HubSpot marketing automation or Marketo and I'm not you know I'm, I'm not smart enough when I, you know to know through tracking codes and some of these content that I already know who you are even right like forget new people I like people still are forced to fill out forms even yeah. you know you know who they are so it's like it feels um like we're creating a bad customer experience before the purchase um be, to follow some playbooks or some like all you know lead gen numbers that we need to plug in to tell yeah. us about this because this sort of signals in my view that like you know whatever don't tr don't trust us that we're an easy to use easy to work with product because we're kind of adding a bunch of you know, banana spills right in front of your entrance point yeah. into our product. And that is all that exists because a long time ago, leads were cheap and SaaS people were expensive. And so we were protecting in the CAC mix, the headcount cost SaaS people at the expense of generating a lot of cheap leads because clicks and SEO was, was cheap. Now the top of funnel is expensive mm. leads a qualified lead is like hundreds of dollars these days, right? There's no point in protecting the salespeople's time, especially because most of that is automated anyways with AI, right? Yeah. And so what we should be doing is making sure the qualified lead gets the least friction possible because we already paid for the qualification in the acquisition if we did a good job. No extra friction necessary. Oh, this, this is like, I, I love that you brought in the, the AI because what I'm like, what we are advocating, what we're thinking about is like, how do you bring the high value engaging experience that a sales rep, you know, I don't think ASDR generally provide that much value, you know, in the customer interactions, although there are some exceptions, but the, like, let's say a sales rep does generally, you know, you know, if they know their space provides some value. But they're expensive to your point still, right? Like they're maybe not, you know, as expensive as, as you know, relatively, but still a, you know, high, highly expensive to scale type of function. And then what if we could take what the best um, sales reps do, right? In terms of they really create a choice, educational experience for a customer. They really kind of have an interaction of some kind. And we start putting that into more scalable mechanisms, right? Whether it's a interactive product tour, or it's a, you know, the ebook that allows you to find a problem that you actually give a damn about versus just generic stuff, right? Or a presentation, you know, webinar presentation where you jump exactly to the parts that matter to you. Or this podcast, we're going to record it into chapters um, and put it in a pod book so you, you don't need to listen to the whole hour, although I recommend everybody does, but to the parts that really resonate with your current pains. So that sort of is a, what great marketers, great salespeople are able to do um but yet i think it sort of not hasn't become scalable well, you know what's preventing what's preventing these right like, why are we stating these general spammy you know sounding things that everybody was going to pattern match and could recognize it's ai generated stuff yeah i think because um it's going back to the creativity i think it all those things worked at some point in time in the past all right when they came out a lot of those things had created a fairly significant boosting conversion rate for a short period of time. What happens, though, is that the audience gets, uh, and the, the tactic gets abused. The audience mm. becomes desensitized, right. but the marketers are still running the campaigns. Right. <laughs> so, so it's like the generals office. that are fighting the last war, right? They're like, their marketers yeah. are fighting the last uh, tactics that work. It's Absolutely. Kind of yeah. And, and, and so one of the issues is we're all kind of like doing a rat race to the bottom in terms of quality, because we are mimicking or hoping to mimic human um, generated content efforts, probably we're trying to mimic yeah. human effort in order to elicit reciprocity 
from the audience. Mm -hmm. And we're just looking for the cheapest ways to do that. I come from a time and place uh, uh, a while back where we used to like uh, offshore all content creation, right? At scale, mm -hmm. right? And we would have people in, in you know, other countries far away, which sort of extremely cheap, create like hundreds of like content pieces, landing pages and whatnot, right? right. And, and in order to have the audience believe that there was the time and effort of somebody close to them doing that in order to get reciprocity, right? And that kind of worked and it was just an arbitrage, right? It's an arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Now that with AI, you can do that with even greater scale and even lower cost. And it's just another arbitrage, right? And the more, the higher the quality of the output and the lower the cost, the more it's going to be abused and people are going to be desensitized. That's so it. What, so, so, so we're going to be like, it's the race to the bottom for attention, right? Yes. And engagement. So what's, what are the, you know, what are the things that are perennial, right? Like what are the things that will never go out of, out of fashion? Do those exist? Or are we just always kind of on this curve of so, like writing something and then learning when to get, when there's the right time to jump off or de de-emphasize certain things? Like, because I think fundamentally we want to believe that there is perennial value. Yeah. Um, there's two things. The one that always works is generating true value for your audience in a way that's not, um, that's truly helpful. Mm. Okay. If you look at most outbound emails or most content pieces, the goal is to generate a lead. You're talking about your product, your company, all right? But what if you could create something, and I can share examples, that was about not you, but about them, about their business, their job, a real problem they face, or something that you mm. discovered that they should attend to. Mm. That is truly helpful. Now you're creating value. That will always work. Right. That's one. And second is reciprocity, all right? True reciprocity always works because as humans, that's like thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years of evolution that have taught us to like elicit reciprocity. Got it. So we're starting with the customer, right? Like kind of the use the, the, the old fashioned Steve Jobs quote, right? But it's sort of perennial true. You know, you start with the customer and then walk backwards to either technology or tactic or whatever. It is, and if you can deliver that value, and ideally, you know, using since you're in growth, deliver that value quickly, right? Like, and and hopefully at some degree of scale, that's where the the opportunities. And then on the reciprocity, so let's talk about this, right? Obviously, you know, you're the master of Cialdini, and you know th that sort of is the one of the core principles. But how do we create true? reciprocity that sort of feels you know really authentic because I, I i think for one way what you said yeah is like does it feel authentic or is it authentic and 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 so here's the here's the gist of it yeah you're trying to sell to them it's never going to be truly authentic we're not talking of like a personal connection here while like i'm i'm you know giving somebody away with like no second thoughts i am I want to engage. I want to get something in exchange. Truly, like I'm in a commercial exchange here. I'm doing business. Okay. This is not a nonprofit. Okay. But you can create as much, can get close to it. And you should strive to get close to it. Okay. There are ways to do that. But here's the, here's the thought experiment. Okay. If you think of like all the, emails, outbound emails, topic I know well that we've sent over the past couple of years, we've tried to create the feeling, the perception of humanness, that a human wrote this. There's merge tags, there's been, you know, um, generated uh, images with, you know, the whiteboard with your name on it. Now we have deep yeah. fake uh, video SDRs. Why do we do that? Here's why. At home, you have a letterbox. In the letterbox, you get mostly junk mail. That junk mail, you throw away with almost no you know, feeling emotions, you just don't care. Just take the pie and just put it in the trash bin, right? So you, mm. absolutely, you absolutely don't care, right? Um, now, let's say that in that pie, you find this letter, and this letter comes from this, like, old senior person 
that has written your name, Alex, on it, mm-hmm. all right? And there's their name on the back and they have licked the, the stamp and they put the stamp on the envelope. How likely are you, Alex, to take that envelope for the, from this unknown person and throw it in the bin without opening it? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I'll answer it. Most likely my kids are going to open the envelopes these days. Yeah. Right. And, and they're, so they're very, becoming the bots, but it, you're right. Like, so it's, it's very it's unlikely. Connect, very unlikely. Why is that? Yeah. Why do you open this envelope when you don't know that person? You don't expect an email from um, a mail, a letter from them. Yeah. You don't yeah. really care. Why do you do that? Why? And that is because you know it is an effort to write with you with a damn pen. Right. These days, it's an effort to put it in the mailbox. Right. There, and there's a reason for that effort. You elicit reciprocity. You respect that effort by doing some of mm-hmm. yours. And you're curious. The two things, reciprocity, curiosity. You can't escape that in the mm-hmm. same way that if somebody comes to you and it is like some kind of like there's some holiday event, something, somebody has a gift for you and you don't have a gift yeah. for them, you'll feel yeah. terrible. And it's reciprocity. Yeah. Right. You need to give something back. And so when in my marketing, and let's get to content and PDFs here for a second. Most are most are trash. Most of the white uh uh and you know white papers and, and ebooks, the content itself is like not inspiring. There's not yeah. anything useful. But yeah. sometimes it is. Like I have a couple of like PDFs which I uh, and white papers that I download religiously every every year because they contain benchmarks. I need to go back to that. They're useful. And I show them in my in my slides, right? Yeah. Um, and in, in in my Zoom calls, I get back to those because there's there's something unique, valuable in there, all right? And so again, we're going back to the thing. There is value. Value elicits reciprocity. If that somebody is asking me of something. I'm very likely to give it because right. now what you're I'm, describing I'm is we're, we're putting a bunch of blocks in front of the value. So let's assume you've wrote, you put your life into some beautiful book, ebook, white paper, whatever it is, right? You, you're still driving a bunch of uh, money, you know, that is expensive increasingly, right? For startups to get people to your website, then you're putting all these obstacles in front of them, right? Like you're the forms, yes. The the not knowing who they are the, because you suppose the, that the, the content is so valuable. Yeah, you suppose they believe there's so much value yeah. that they will expense their reciprocity first, the yeah. the part of the exchange first before accessing the content. Yeah. And you do that because the content is bad, yeah. because you know that once they see the content, they're like, ah, this is terrible. This is like I gave something, like, I got yeah, nothing back. Yeah. yeah. So yes. we're like in this sort of like people that think they're in the customer engagement the business. You know, end up being in the kind of value destruction business, you know, especially as the content landscape becomes competitive, right? Because, um, again, the tactic, like maybe there was a world where an ebook was novel, right? And you could get away with all sorts of stuff if you had like a very niche subject. Now that's becoming less and less so, right? And, you know, same for the sales presentations and so on. So very interesting. Now, you know, a lot of pessimism right here, yet, you know, you're thriving, your business is, is doing, you know, is doing well, you're attracting all the top leaders in the growth world as part of your organization. So tell us about what, like, what is, what's kind of, what's the special sauce um, that is driving your kind of your opportunity for you. And you've kind of created effectively a new model of these kind of experts, you know, they're earning equity. Through their yeah, advice. I think the there are a couple of things that I, that I realized. One is advisory, if not taken seriously, doesn't work. If you're just doing like a coffee here and there with the founders, like nothing gets really done, right? And this is the first thing. The second is for the advisor, um, it's the same game as the angel investor. You need to do a lot of uh advisory roles in order to find one outlier and that's almost impossible to do so what i've built is something that is a hybrid between a, a vc firm where we have a lot of deal flow meet a lot of founders get intros from other vcs but we don't invest we do sweat equity we we take equity in exchange for like effort right at scale and we pool the equity um in a common investment vehicle 
uh, across all the companies on a given year. Okay, so everyone that's part of the advisory network gets exposure to every company on one given year. Um, that's very exciting for the advisor. On the company side, it's really about being able to bring unaccessible talent at their stage to empower their team currently mm. to go faster and de-risk, right? If you are a, somebody like me, somebody like uh, Luke, uh, Lee Neverna, Dyer's Contractor, people that have had major growth roles over the past couple of years, um, how likely are you to go and take the risk at the Series A or Series B company, right? Very unlikely. Like, why would you do that? All right? This is like, there's, there's no rational. And most of those people are also financially successful. They, they don't care, right? So the only way for you to be able to access that very rare talent, when I say rare, we're talking like less than 100 people mm. um, in B2B SaaS. It's, it's a small talent pool that has the know-how of doing B2B growth time and time again, right? And so we're just giving you access to that talent. There's, it's not an agency. There's no junior people. There's no freelancers. It's just a marketplace where we can find you senior talent that's willing to think about your company challenges in the world of marketing and growth a couple hours a week and empower your team. Got it. That's really helpful. It's one of the things that I, I find that surprises me and like you know motivates to 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 reach higher is that you brought up that you know all of your experts are in the world of b2b SaaS, and that's kind of historically how you know the software companies have been more innovative in some of the these techniques but yet you know majority of marketers are maybe in b2b actually but not necessarily in b2b SaaS companies and they still need to be creative they still need to be analytical right because that's sort of the nature of the discipline that you need to combine those two to be ultimately successful so what what can we do to bring the b2b SaaS to the rest of the world right and maybe it's not going to be relevant for your firm right because you need disproportionate you know outcomes you know that are venture back but like still the lessons that you've learned the the they're you know i hope they're you know, applied beyond this niche? What's your take? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, like, this is my niche. And I always love a good niche market of very low competition, right? And so that's why I operate there. Uh, okay. So you're applying your, you're applying your own, you're applying your own uh, well, growth, yeah. growth time, well, that's obviously. Unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, that's the first thing. And and so like, yeah, the, that that's a good niche where we operate and we have we play very well there. Outside of that, uh, there are some people doing it. For it's worth. There are people like Sean Ellis, who is doing evangelism and education, you know, on in larger businesses like PayPal and others, right? I think it's a challenge. I think it's a multi-year challenge. I think it's unclear whether it's actually going to work out yet, um, whether large organizations are, whether the, the role, just to come full circle on discussion, the role of growth will set foot and like have a defined uh, existence in large organizations. Right now, it's still a day-to-day -day battle, right? I'm being called by public companies on a fairly regular basis to like help them set a growth team. And I just, for now, most of them, they just don't have the buy-in to take those risks. So you're asking me, what does it take? It takes competitive pressure and willingness to do something different, right? Then you're coming to say, if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to have a growth team and that growth team is not going to succeed. The last question, will AI create that competitive pressure, right? Will the sort of, you know, creation of content at scale, saturation of the channels, um, you know, everybody trying to do PLG. And so there's only that many products that you could try as a normal human being. Will that kind of create the pressure to continue innovation? What is going to, what do you anticipate is going to happen in the future to the discipline? Yeah. Uh, it is going to change more than we thought in the sense that it's going to change the way that we buy. Um, 
entirely. The way that we buy has been, if we put away PLG, it's been through humans, all right? Humans creating content, humans creating like um, emails, communication, PDF, you know, uh, all of that. Humans on calls, humans on chat. We're having like human to human conversations, maybe one too many, right? Mm -hmm. But if you pursue that thought process far enough, a couple of quarters, I'm talking, maybe a year, a year or two, you're having humans buying from AI. There are people working on that right now, like right now. And that is likely to start happening in engineering products where a sales discussion, negotiation, will be between a buyer and an AI, and then between an AI and AI, right? right? There's an AI that's making a recommendation, like, hey, here's the tools we should check. And then it's going to reach out with an RFP to like all the vendors. And there's the AI on the receiving end that gets the RFP, forecasts the price, sends back the data, and then there's a call that's being made, all right? So that all, all of that is very likely, all the software technology buying is, is likely to be heavily automated. And when that happens, and you think this is transactional or like, because I think if you're trying to create new categories, I don't see this happening as much. I see this as much more mature transactional. Spaces. Yes, but most companies don't create categories. Most companies yeah. jump into an existing category with a small difference. Got it. So the more commoditized the area, the footprint, and as, as technology matures, the more it will be dependent on this type of interaction. Yes, absolutely. You're just going to be filling RFPs automatically. Love it. Very much, very much like the like the, the trading business, like and like and 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 the, and the stock business, right? Right. If you think of like uh you know start buying and selling, um public stock. I mean, it's been like most of the trading is automated, entirely automated, and it's quant funds and like it's AI, it's some form of AI algorithmic trading. Right, that does most of the trading entirely. All right, the 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 rest is like very marginal. It's mostly companies publishing um, quarterly reports and some algorithmic checking the news, the numbers, and making a decision. There's no reason it get, gets different. Like, no reason. So, is there a breakout from that? That is a a game changer, right? Back to creating new categories yes. or engaging now, the human spirit where it still has control. <laughs> uh, for now, um, I do not, I've, I've tested a couple of like large language models for growth purposes. They don't try crazy things. It is mostly because they rely on, uh, you know, existing literature right they are not great yet i don't know what happens in the future but they're not great yet at being extremely creative and thinking out of the box because they are the box yeah well if anybody needs to create a large language model on growth it's guillaume guillaume thank you so much for coming over thank you alex a insightful discussion always uh, love your insights um uh, and opinions and you know again people the track record of some of the companies we love and use uh you were kind of one of their early advisors to g2 um right. you know we love godard so if, if the people that we think are already like mountains and you know uh in the world are still tapping your advice you know this has just been a real privilege glad to share this um with our audience guillaume how could people uh, connect and follow your thoughts yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to reach me at uh, hypergrowthpartners.com. My email is g at hypergrowthpartners.com. That's very easy. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. If you need growth, that's the email I would write down. Gian, thank you so much for, for thank coming. Thank you, Alex. Have a good one.